Thank you for joining my presentation on using and interpreting carbon monoxide diffusing capacity, or DLCO, correctly. My name is Terrence Shenfield, and I've been an education coordinator as well as co-owner of a and Respiratory Lectures. All of our lectures are approved by the American Association of Respiratory Care and offer you continuous education towards your license. I hope you enjoy this presentation. For today's objectives, I'm going to be talking about the various aspects of a diffusing capacity test. Um, it's also known as a transfer factor test. And the basics of a diffusing capacity is you inhale a gas and it determines how well that gas actually attaches to the hemoglobin molecules in the red blood cells. And how quickly it attaches, how much it attaches, determines on your respiratory uh, status. It's mainly used for patients with respiratory disorders. And there's a whole host of respiratory disorders, which we'll get into. So today, we're going to talk about what is the diffusing capacity and why do we do the test. I'm going to talk a little bit about the physiology involved. I'm going to talk about test performances. I'm also going to talk about variability in uh, capacity measurements. I'm going to be talking about how do you interpret the results. And then most importantly, which I'm going to focus a lot on, is the clinical utility of a diffusing capacity. Uh, there's a lot of information here, and I could tell you that any kind of uh, diffusing capacity test has to be done with spirometry, too. You just can't do one without the other. So sit back, and we'll learn together. Before we go much into uh, our presentation, I wanted to give you a short animated example of what exactly is a DLCO test. Um, I have special thanks to NDDMED. Uh, if you wanted to get this uh, YouTube video yourself, there's the link. But special thanks to them. And it's a very short video, and it'll explain everything you need to know. But then I'm going to go into much more details. How to Perform Good DLCO Tests Hello, and welcome to this educational movie. Thank you for taking the time to watch this short video. After watching this video, you will know how to perform a test that will show how well you can take up oxygen through your lungs. The lung function test is dependent on your cooperation, and your doctor is very thankful for your effort. It is normal that the test is performed multiple times in order to achieve an optimal quality. To perform right on the test, you will now have to breathe normally for a few breaths, then exhale completely. Then, when instructed, inhale deeply and quickly and hold your breath for 10 seconds. Then, exhale quickly for about 3 to 5 seconds. Then you will have to inhale again to stop the test. The lung function test explained does not have any side effects and is completely safe. The nose clip is important to make sure no air leaks through your nose while performing the test. Please sit up straight with both feet flat on the floor. Please place your teeth around the mouthpiece and close your lips. Do not bite or block the mouthpiece with your tongue or teeth and keep your lips sealed. Now, please breathe normally in the beginning. and then exhale completely. You will be asked to take one deep breath of test gas. Please inhale deeply and quickly, as much as you can. Hold your breath for 10 seconds. Exhale quickly for about three to five seconds. Now please inhale again in order to stop the test. Well done. You now learned how to perform a DLCO test.
one of the major benefits of the DLCO test is to evaluate respiratory symptoms. And this test has been established for over 100 years ago, but it really has improved over the years. Um, it could also, if you've been diagnosed with some kind of a respiratory disorder, say like you have um, pulmonary fibrosis, it could actually determine what stage you are in, if it's getting worse, if it's getting better. And so it could almost determine your severity and it also could determine the course of your treatment. So if they give you a special therapy and you respond positively, the DLCO test will um, actually show it. It also very useful to screen subclinical diseases. And what do I mean by subclinical? Um, there's a term called high altitude pulmonary edema. A lot of people who climb high mountain areas and sometimes when they do a pulmonary function test, um, the test comes up normal, but when they do the DLCO, it comes up abnormal. And so they could sort of indicate that there's some form of pulmonary edema with these patients, even though the spirometry tests were normal. So there's a lot of great value to this. And there's so many different me medical conditions and respiratory conditions that can benefit from monitoring these values. So now let's get a little bit more detail exactly what kind of illnesses, what kind of conditions uh, will the DLCO test show? For example, if you wanted to differentiate whether someone has asthma or from emphysema or from, or from asthma to COPD, this is a test to go to. It could determine anemia. It's a great test for sarcoidosis where you can look at the stage of sarcoidosis and then the treatment plans and how it's responding. It could respond to alveolar hemorrhages. It can look at restrictive lung disease. It can look at a pulmonary fibrosis. It can look at early stages of pulmonary hypertension. It's for interstitial lung disease. It's for COPD. It's for pulmonary vascular disease. So you could see that there's a whole host of respiratory disorders here. And this is the test to determine the severity of it and whether it's getting worse or if it's improving. So a lot of value, and we're gonna get a little bit more detail about each particular test as we go along. So what exactly is a diffusing capacity test? And I wanted to give you a little update that number one, this test in Europe is called transfer factor test. They have a different name for the exact same test. So exactly why is this useful? Why is this medically useful? And why is it very important in regard to respiratory disorders? When we breathe in air, the air comes into our lungs and then works its way into the alveolar. From the alveolar, it meets the alveolar capillary membrane and then the gas diffuses from the alveola into the capillary bed, which has red blood cells. In the red blood cells, we have hemoglobin. So oxygen attaches to the hemoglobin, and this is done, then it's transported to the rest of the body for use. So the process of breathing in air, coming into the alveola, transferring over into the capillary membrane, passing the capillary membrane and going into the red blood cell and then attaching to the hemoglobin. That is the whole process of diffusion. Now, any kind of medical condition that can impede this can represent a problem. So what they do in this test, they know the process. So what they found out that carbon monoxide at a very low level, like 0.3%, which is used in the test, has a higher affinity for oxygen, no, has a higher affinity for hemoglobin than oxygen. So the point, that is why they use carbon monoxide at such a low level, because if, if the hemoglobin molecule has an option to take on carbon monoxide or oxygen, it's gonna jump for the carbon monoxide. So what happens is um, we breathe in this inert gas, which contains about, 0.3% carbon monoxide, oxygen, nitrogen, and then sometimes they use this inert gas like helium at 10%, which is not really absorbed into the bloodstream, but it's like basically it's a, it's a marker. 
Um, so what happens is we breathe in this mixture of gas, one deep breath, and then we blow it out. And how much of the carbon monoxide is absorbed into the bloodstream and attaches to the hemoglobin molecule, and then how much, how much we blow out and how long it takes is the determination if we have any kind of underlying interstitial disease. So this process makes it very valuable to diagnose any kind of pulmonary disorder. So pulmonary disorders could come in various shapes. First of all, if you got collapsed alveola atelectasis, you're not going to actually diffuse much gas in those areas. So you're going to have a lower DLCO. If the Aviola is full of fluid. If you have pulmonary edema, it's not going to get transferred, so you have a lower DLCO. If you have a pneumonia, you're going to have a lower DLCO. Suppose the hemoglobin concentration in the red blood cells is lower. Suppose you're anemic. If you're anemic, that means you got less um, hemoglobin, and that means there's less attachment of the carbon monoxide molecule to it. And again, they can identify whether you have anemia. Uh, the third value of this is cardiac output. And this, in other words, if you don't have enough cardiac output, you will have a lower DLCO. So any kind of condition that has a reduced cardiac output or would we would call this a perfusion issue um, is identified. So that's exactly how this diffusion capacity test works. And it's quite complex because there's a whole host of uh, disorders that work in this category. So I wanted to further my explanation of exactly what a diffusing capacity test is and exactly um, the various steps it goes through when, you know, we take for granted when we breathe in and out, but there's a lot of steps to it. So let me go over it again a little bit with you. First of all, it all starts with our airway. So we breathe in air. So we breathe in our air, it comes down, and it finally works its way into the alveola, right? At that point, the alveola has to pass through, the gas has to pass through uh, the alveolar epithelium, which is right here. And this epithelium, um, if it's damaged for any reason, obviously, you know, like interstitial disease or, or fibrotic tissue, it's not going to diffuse as easy. Eventually, it works its way in, it has to go past from the alveolar, and this is the um, capillary membrane right here. It has to go through that capillary membrane. And then what it's really looking to do is it, you, it sees these red blood cells right here. And inside the red blood cell, you have hemoglobin. So eventually, the oxygen attaches to the hemoglobin and then is transported to the rest of the body. At the same time, when our body removes CO2, uh, the CO2 is released uh, from the cells, works it back into the alveolar, and that's exhalation. So you could see there could be a bunch of problems along the way. If you have a problem with you have uh, edema in the alveolar, you're going to have less diffusion. If you have some kind of um, fibrotic tissue, interstitial fibrosis, that's going to impede that. If you have a decrease in cardiac output, suppose you, you know, you have decreased cardiac output, or you basically have anemia, you have less red blood cells, that can create a problem. So this test is a very, very valuable test to determine underlying medical conditions, what's going on in the body. And we're going to go over some of the major ones as we go along. This is another great image of the interface between the alveola and the capillaries. Uh, for example, this area up here represents the alveola. And as gas comes in, oxygen, nitrogen, and so on, and even carbon monoxide when they do the DLCO test, it diffuses through the membrane. Now, things that can impact the membrane, suppose you have an interstitial fibrosis, could impair the diffusion of gas. Uh, once the gas actually comes into the capillaries and works its way into the bloodstream, um, there's a second feature. And the second feature is uh, hemoglobin. For example, in red blood cells, um, hemoglobin is in the red blood cells, and that was what really makes oxygen attached to it. Also, uh, in the carbon monoxide test, um, 
carbon monoxide has a high affinity for hemoglobin. So if you have any kind of disease condition that decreases your hemoglobin, you will see a change. Another very important fact is the rate of reaction with hemoglobin. Due to different various chemical factors, sometimes um, oxygen and CO cannot attach to hemoglobin, you know, due to like hemoglobin and so on. So this is how the diffusion of gas actually works through the membrane. And this is when you do the actual diffusion capacity test, you could actually determine what kind of conditions. For example, uh, with COPD, with patients who have emphysema, a lot of times they have a reduced diffusion capacity because of lost aviola resulting in lower surface area. Another thing you want to think about, if some patient has a heat anemia, if you have anemia, that means you have less red blood cells. And if you have less red blood cells, that means you have less uh, the ability to attach to uh, hemoglobin. And then thirdly, sometimes patients who have what is known as diffuse alveolar hemorrhage or DAH. And basically what happens here is uh, you have a lot of... Um, uh, damage to the pulmonary vascular system, and that impedes uh, the, all of these cause like a decrease in diffusion capacity. Conditions that it will give you an increased DLCO are like obesity, asthma, and the reason they believe that is because you have increased blood volumes and increased um, breathing volumes, the bigger tidal volumes, and these causes an increase in DLCO. So you can really identify a bunch of different disorders just based on the DLCO, and it's a very valuable test. So let's get a little bit into the diffusing capacity physiology. And you may be wondering, why do they use CO, carbon monoxide, in this test? Um, the... You know, we all know that oxygen is essential to cellular metabolism, but carbon monoxide is used in this test. And the reason for that is that carbon monoxide has a higher affinity for hemoglobin molecules than oxygen. Actually, the capacity for carbon monoxide to attach to the hemoglobin molecule is almost 200 to 250 times greater than oxygen. As a result, um, the binding sites on the cell membrane of the hemoglobin molecule um, actually bind much quicker and are stronger than oxygen. And they also use very little part, a uh, very little percentage of carbon monoxide, which we know is kind of poisonous because if too much carbon monoxide attaches to the hemoglobin molecule, then we're not going to be able to attach oxygen. And then without oxygen in our body, we're going to die. So that's how people die from carbon monoxide poisoning. And if you are uh, a little bit of a geek, which uh, I got a little bit of a geek in me and you wanted to know exactly why does a gas is transfused from the alveola into the capillary membrane. It's done, it's done by Fick's law, and you might remember Fick's law and Graham's law, and it has to do with the amount of gas transferred across the membrane is directly proportional to the surface area and the diffusion constant. Um, in regard to surface area, illnesses that decreased surface area will have a decrease in DLCO. Um, also, um, fibrotic tissue, um, that can impact the diffusion of it. Uh, but this is how exactly it comes across and why they use carbon monoxide, because it has a greater affinity. And actually, the hemoglobin molecule has so many receptor sites on it for CO, even greater than oxygen. So that is why they use this gas. This slide gives you an overview of the grades of severity of DLCO reduction. Um, if you're a geek and you like formulas, you could see the formula that's on the bottom right over here. Uh, but these are the values. Normal DLCO is greater than 75% of predicted up to 140% because you can have a greater value than 100 and then it's based upon, you know, like I said, obesity and asthma. Um, you can have mild reduction from 60% to the lower limits of normal. A moderate reduction is anywhere from 40 to 60% and severe reduction is less than 40% of lower limits of normal. So these are how they classify the severity of your disorder.
this particular PowerPoint that I'm presenting now is not going to be speaking much on how exactly do you do the diffusing capacity test, but more importantly, the interpretation. I think as clinicians at the bedside, understanding the values of a DLCO can be very helpful. And I'm going to get a little bit into each particular type of medical condition that the test shows. For example, if you are less than 80% of predicted, uh, you typically can have either obstructive lung disease, you could have pulmonary vascular disease, you could have anemia. And if you have an increased DLCO, which is anywhere from 120 to 140% of predicted, normally you could find this with asthma. You could also find this with patients who are overweight or, or an obese. You can also find patients who have pyo, pyo, polycythemia, where they have too many red blood cells and too much hemoglobin. You could also see this with pulmonary hemorrhages, and you could also see this with left to right shunts. Now, I'm just giving you a quick overview, but as we go along through this presentation, I'm going to get a little bit more detail about each particular uh, disease category. So I wanted to go over a little bit of detail about what is a normal diffusing capacity. And a normal diffusing capacity test is about 25 milliliters of carbon monoxide per minute per millimeter of mercury. Uh, that is your standard value based on normal. Um, another thing that's very important that a DLCO is never give a standalone test. You need to do spirometry. And you might ask, why do you need to do spirometry? Because first of all, you need to determine whether you are normal or if you have a restrictive disorder or if you have an obstructive disorder. And the reason for that, based upon your DLCO and based upon whether you have a restrictive disorder or obstructive disorder, you could differentiate between disease types. For example, if you wanted to differentiate between asthma or emphysema, you really, both of them are obstructive disorders, but uh, if the DLCO is greater than the lower limits of normal, then it's asthma. And if it's not, it's most likely emphysema. And you could also do the same thing with restrictive disorders, say, for example, chest wall and neuromuscular disorders normally have a DLCO greater than the lower limits of normal. Uh, but if you had like um, interstitial lung disease, it would not be. So based upon if you're obstructive or restrictive, or if you are normal, and also based upon your DLCO value where you fall, that is how you would identify what kind of disease or disorder you have. When identifying what kind of disorder a patient may have, there are two main categories, either you're perfusion limited or you're diffusion limited. If you are perfusion limited, think about cardiac output, think about anemia, think about those aspects that will impede oxygen transport. It could also be that your hemoglobin has some kind of disorder that it will not bind with oxygen. So these would be considered perfusion limited items. Another one would be diffusion limited. And when you think about diffusion, think about gas being diffused from the alveola a capillary membrane into this red blood cell. And anything that would impede oxygen transfer by some kind of physical barrier would be in this category. For example, for example, sorry, atelectasis. Atelectasis is collapsed alveola. There's a barrier. Pulmonary fibrosis, fibrotic tissue doesn't um, uh, diffuse very easily. Emphysema, you have dis um, damaged uh, surface area, pneumonia, you have blockage, interstitial edema, again, you have blockage. So understanding whether you are perfusion limited or diffusion limited is very important. I wanted to go over some disease processes that demonstrate a DLCO. And I have to say that most of the disease processes out there will cause a decreased DLCO rather than an increased DLCO. 
uh, the very short list of items that are increased DLCOs, and I'm going to mention that a little bit later. But first, we're going to focus on some of the major uh, disease processes with that will demonstrate a decreased DLCO. And remember, all of these tests are done with spirometry because, you know, that's part of identifying what kind of disorder you have. So let's take, for example, emphysema. Emphysema on a, a PFT will show an obstructive pattern. And the problem with emphysema is the destruction of the alveolar membrane. And this causes a problem with surface area for gas diffusion. Um, other type of disorders are interstitial lung disease as well as idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Both of those are a restrictive pattern on PFTs. Both of them result in alveolar capillary membrane thickening, and both of them can have a different cause. For example, um, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis could be caused by something that you inhale. You could like fibr um asbestos. It could also be by autoimmune disorders such as rheumatoid arthritis, sarcoidosis on a pulmonary function. It could be a mixed result. You could get both obstructive and um, restrictive pattern. And the problem with that is that these patients suffer from anemia, and this is due to non-caseating granulomas. And what they don't is they have very poor stores of iron in their bone marrow. And iron is very important toward hemoglobin. Um, some other studies are going out there on HIV, and especially the ones who are suffering from PCP. And what they feel is that it's an obstructive pattern on pulmonary function. And the problem with this is uh, marked inflammation of the airways. So these are some disease patterns that could be identified with DLCO, a little bit of a background, exactly what's going on with that. And I have enough more to talk about on the next slide. I'm going to cover some more disease processes with a demonstrated decreased DLCOs. Um, in regard to pulmonary vascular disease, also pulmonary arterial hypertension, um, what they found with the DLCO test is both reduced and it's a strongly associated with the survivability of patients across different etiologies. So basically, it's an independent predictor of death. So as your DLCO gets worse and you happen to suffer from any of these conditions, uh, your likelihood of survival is decreased. They could also use it with pulmonary embolism. Again, this is a reduction in DLCOs. It's a simple process of determining whether uh, you have a PE. And more importantly, it could tell the responsiveness of anticoagulant um, medications that you're taking. So if you're being treated, they can tell whether you're going in the right direction. Um, Left-sided heart failure. Um, again, this shows a restrictive pattern. And they found that with these particular patients, there was a reduction in alveolar capillary membrane surface area that was available for gas exchange, which um, gave a decreased DLCO. And uh, pretty obviously, if you have anemia, and you have less red blood cells and you have less hemoglobin, you're going to have a less um, DLCO. And there's a linear correlation between hemoglobin levels and the blood and the DLCO. So yes, uh, pretty obviously, if you have anemia, you will have a, a decreased DLCO. There are certain conditions that show an increase in DLCO, and they can be pulmonary hemorrhage, Oh, pulmonary vasculitis, could be polycythemia, could be asthma, could be obesity, and it could be pregnancy if you're not anemic. So some of the reasons for each of this is that uh, in regard to pulmonary hemorrhage, if you are bleeding and blood is in your alveolar space, what that means is there's more hemoglobin to actually take up uh, the CO and resulting in higher levels of DLCOs. So if you're bleeding and the blood goes into the alveolar space, actually you show an increase in DLCO. Not the best thing in the world, but that's what's happening. Polycythemia can be caused by exercise. If you're running and you're doing a lot of exercise and you're really fit, sometimes you could have um, more red blood cells and this can result in more hemoglobin being uh, 
absorbed than the higher levels of DLCO. Asthmatic patients, uh, due to hyperinflation of the chest, increased intrathoracic pressures, there's actually an increase in pulmonary capillary blood flow and resulting in more red blood cells and then higher levels of DLCO when you do the test. Obesity. Obesity, the, 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 re, the reason obese patients have higher DLCO values is because of increased pulmonary blood volume and flow, and this actually causes a change in your DLCO values. In regard to pregnant women, uh, pregnant women who are not anemic, uh, they have actually increased cardiac output, increased intravascular volume, and both are uh, conducive to increased DLCO. So these are some of the cases of DLCO. There's not many of them as compared to a decrease, but I just thought I'd mention them. So I want to go over a couple of case studies with you um, in regard to pulmonary function and a little bit about DLCO, and hopefully we all learn from it. So uh, we have a 65-year-old man who undergoes a pulmonary function test as part of his routine health screening test. He had no pulmonary complaints. He's a lifelong non-smoker, uh, but he did have a prior history of asbestos exposure while serving in the Navy. And his pulmonary function results are as follows. So you'll notice that when they did the spirometry testing, they have the predicted value, they have the actual value, and they also have the percent predicted, and they also did a pre and post bronchodilator study. So we, you know, it's a pretty good comprehensive test. So going over some of the features of this uh, particular test, um, his his force vital capacity was predicted to be 4.32. He came in at 4.39. His FEV1 came in at 95% uh, as predicted. His um, FVV1 over FVC percentage is like 73, 78. Uh, his residual volume is at 2.54. Um, they guessed it would be 2.32. Um, and his DLCO, uh, which came in at 25.69, and the predicted value based on his age and so on was 31.28. So if you look at all these values, um, in my opinion, nothing really looks bad. Now let's take a look at the bronchodilator study. So they did a uh, bronchodilator test, and then they looked at his force vital capacity. It came in as a negative one. Then they looked at the FEV1, and the percent change was a plus seven. And then they looked at the FEV1 over FEC, and that came in at eight. Um, I don't know if you would consider that significant or not. I know the answer, and basically, I want you to tell me the answer on that. So let's go on to the next slide. So I'm going to give you some time to look at this patient's flow volume loop. Take a good look at it. Look at the peak expiratory flow. Look at the inspiratory effort. And most importantly, look at the expiratory effort. Look at the residual volume. So what do you see? Does it look normal? Or if it doesn't look normal, what do you see? So let's do in some interpretation of this case. Does this look like a normal or an abnormal pulmonary function test? Would you say that this patient values are normal or abnormal? And the answer is, um, both the FVC and the FEV1 were at 102 and 95% of predicted, uh, and the value is well above the lower limits of normal. Uh, the FEV1 to FVC ratio was greater than predicted. Uh, so basically, that's a very normal 
PFT test in regard to that loop. Let's look at the second question. What about the flow volume loop? What do you think about it? The flow volume loop corresponds quite nicely to the predicted values of these patients. Um, the patient had a normal lung total capacity. It also, there was no evidence of restriction. Um, even the diffusion capacity was very normal, which actually means, means that the alveolar capillary surface area for gas exchange was normal. So again, this is a very normal flow volume loop and results. Was there a significant change in the bronchodilator response? We see in the pre and post, do you think there was a significant change? From the values given, there was no significant change in bronchodilator response. So um, the patient does not have obstructive airway disease. How about her DLCO? Was that normal or abnormal? The answer was normal. It all fell within normal ranges. So this was an interpretation of this particular patient's um, case study, and we're going to be doing another one. This is our second case study, and basically it's a 41-year-old woman who presents to a medical clinic uh, complaining of dyspnea and mild exertion. She has a 10-year smoking history, and she has also a history of using intravenous drugs, which included heroin and Ritalin. Her pulmonary function test is as follows. So she came in there, you know, and she has dyspnea, she has some mild exertion, so they're trying to figure out what's going on with her. So these are the results of the pulmonary function test, and I wanted to point out some information to you. For example, the total lung capacity came in at 108% of predicted. So we could immediately rule out that she does not have a restrictive disorder. That's pretty simple. Let's look at some other values. Um, her residual volume came in at 257% of predicted. So they were predicting her to have about 1.49 liters. She ended up having 3.83 liters. So basically, she has a lot of air trapping going on. If you look at her FEV1, they predicted to come out at 2.57 liters, and she came out at 4.49 liters. So her percent predicted was 19% for her FEV1. She had a 29% prediction on her FEC. She had significant amount of air trapping. And now let's go over to the DLCO. Uh, they were predicting that she would come in at about 24.85. Her DLCO was markedly, tremendously reduced at 0.75. So she has, from what we could see, she has a real problem with her DLCO, and she really has some kind of obstructive pattern going on, and she has a significant amount of air trapping. So they did a post, uh, pre and post bronchodilator study. So the percent change on the bronchodilator study came in at negative 17% for FEC and came in at negative 10 for the FEV1. So when you really look at this, uh, she did not respond to a bronchodilator at all. So she has obstruction, she has trapping, she has a problem with a DLCO, and she doesn't respond to bronchodilators. So what do you think is going on? This We're starting to shape the story about what's going on with her, because the goal is to find out exactly what's going on with her. So let's take a look at her flow volume loop. Um, I know it's a very poor image, but just bear with me. Um, what you can really observe on her peak expiratory flows is this scalloped, see the way uh, the concaved scallop in the peak uh, expiratory flow rates? Um, that would be significant of obstruction. Uh, we have a great x-ray too on the next slide. So. Um, this flow volume loop, um, very poor quality, um, but you can see the scalloping, which is uh, consistent with obstructive disorders. So let's take a look at her x-ray. And it's not a pretty x-ray. 
Um, obviously, someone with that kind of spirometry test, as noted before, you know, you are going to see an x-ray like this. And what really jumps out at me is that you could see um, hyperinflation here very easily. The diaphragm is pushed down pretty flat over here. You could also see this hyperlucency in the airway. You have all these um, markings and infiltrates all over the airway. And it, you know, not a pretty picture. So, um, you know, based upon this x-ray, based upon her spirometry readings, you know, obviously she has some kind of a pulmonary issue. And the question is exactly what kind of pulmonary issue does she have? But this should tell you pretty clearly. Take a look at it. What do you think she has? Remember, the... Um, Asthma did not respond, so we'll, I'll help you out there. It ain't asthma. <laughs> so now that we're, we reviewed her spirometry values and we reviewed her x-ray and we know our history, let's come up with some kind of diagnosis of what's going on with her. Is this patient demonstrating airflow obstruction? And it was pretty easy, yes. Her FEV1, her FVC, and her FEV1 over FVC were all decreased. So she definitely had some form of air obstruction. Does her flow volume loop demonstrate the characteristic scooped out appearance seen in obstructive lung disease? Remember, we were looking at her um, flow volume loop and it was scooped out. So did you see that? Obviously, yes, we did see that. Yes, and this, this actually demonstrates that she has some kind of obstructive disorder as well as reduced peak flows. So again, very obstructive lung disease. Based on our FEV1 of 19% predicted, would this be classified as very severe obstructive disease? What do you think? 19% are predicted. Um, the thing with this, um, she also had evidence of air trapping as her uh, RV was like 257% of predicted, but she would not be classified as hyperinflated because her total lung capacity was only 108% of predicted. So that's the answer with that one. Was there evidence of a bronchodilator response? Remember we had the spirometry pre and post and was she getting some kind of response to it? And there was no evidence of a bronchodilator response because both of her values declined after bronchodilator admission. So what does that mean? That means that she probably doesn't have asthma, right? We could go with that. So this is the second slide of her interpretation. How about her DLCO? Her DLCO was decreased. So what does that mean? What do you think is going on? Uh, basically, that indicated loss of alveolar capillary surface area, and this should be a little prompt, like what makes you think of what kind of disease processes result in a loss of alveolar capillary surface area and show a marked decrease in DLCO? Uh, that's, that's it in a nutshell. If you know what that means, then you'll understand what this process is all about. What do you think the likelihood of her having asthma? Remember we had the pre and post uh, bronchodilator studies? It didn't show much. Actually, um, there was no kind of reversibility of her obstruction with the post uh, bronchodilator. So no, I would say no, she doesn't have asthma. How about her, ch her chest x-ray tells you a lot. And I was trying to go over that and give you some hints with that. You know, she was hyperinflated. She had all this hyperlucency in the basal areas. So what's going on with that? And basically, like I said, she had this hyperlucency at the bases. And basically, that is one of the ways of determining whether someone has emphysema. And basically, with her DLCO being reduced, her not responding to bronchodilators, her air trapping, and her DLCO values, that's a good diagnosis of um, emphysema, and that's exactly what she got. I wanted to follow up with some tidbits about uh, 
different disorders uh, in regard to DLCO. Let's start off with um, emphysema. Uh, there's approximately 11 million uh, patients in the United States who have a COPD. Uh, of that 11 million, uh, approximately 3 million have emphysema. And a diagnosis with using your DLCO, um, so if you happen to have a decreased DLCO and you have airway obstruction, this is when you would consider a diagnosis of emphysema. But if you have a reduced DLCO with normal spirometry readings, that's when you would might consider pulmonary fibrosis. So they sort of differentiate between emphysema and restrictive processes based on spirometry. And when you can put the DLCO together in the equation, it gives you a better uh, idea of what's going on. Another valuable method of monitoring your DLCO is with interstitial uh, lung disease. Um, many of these patients demonstrate a restrictive process. Um, a lot of times if they do a biopsy, they find fibrotic tissue, you have reduced uh, lung volumes. When you look on the x-ray, you will see a patchy distributional ground glass appearance, almost similar to the image we did on that case study of the woman. And a good way of using a DLCO is to monitor it over time and see for any kind of decreases that occur. And you could almost um, estimate that their lung values again and their lung condition is decreasing over time. So a way of monitoring interstitial lung disease and the, and the prognosis of it is to do serial diffusing capacities on these patients. Another good use of using diffusing capacity is with sarcoidosis. Uh, basically, the, um, you, what you have is airway obstruction with lower levels of DLCO. And all, sarcoidosis impacts different parts of the body, you know, your lungs, your skin, your heart, your, your you know, so many different ways. Um, actually, um, it's been shown to be more predominant with uh, North American blacks and European white people. It's more common in women. Uh, granulomas are the telltale sign whether you get it. Um, also, if you look at the x-ray, there'll be like bilateral hyalur endopathy, also diffuse reticular infiltrates. So sarcoidosis is a pretty you know, nasty thing to have but you can monitor, again, the prognosis and how the severity of it by doing diffuser capacity. Another valuable way of using diffusing capacity is with COPD patients. As you know, COPD is an obstructive pattern on spirometry, but normally you'll have a normal DLCO with COPD, unless you have emphysema. So, a good test to determine the severity of your COPD is to make sure your DLCO values stay normal and don't decrease because then you could possibly see that you're going to have some emphysema in your airway too. I want to thank you for joining my presentation. I know I didn't cover all the topics that could be involved with DLCO, but I wanted to give you a quick overview of everything going on with it. Um, DLCOs are very valuable, but they need to be done with the conjunction of a PFT. In other words, you can't just do a DLCO by itself. Um, you have to look at spirometry val values to really get a good feel for everything. Um, you know, you can have an obstructive disorder or a restrictive disorder, but your DLCO can value vary based upon your condition. So you really need to you know, get a thorough understanding like I tried to cover in this uh, lecture. Um, also, you got to remember that a DLCO, you know, someone who's identified with lung disorder or some kind of condition, um, if you look at the change in DLCO over the years, you could almost tell, give a prognosis on the patient to see if they're, do, if they're getting better or if they're getting worse. And it's a very valuable tool. And I hope that you all enjoyed this presentation. Here is a short list of some references I use putting this together. Um, there's more if you want additional references, I have them, but I'm sure this is more than enough to start. And I thank you all for uh, coming to my presentation.